Ready. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Meet the Coach. I'm Pat Kern, one of the co-founders here at our coaching network. Today we got Coach Bay Rasul. He is the senior defensive analyst at Arizona. Coach, I appreciate you jumping on with us. Appreciate you having me, my friend. Always. Of and we've talked for 35 minutes as if we didn't just do a whole combo before this, but I appreciate you jumping on. Uh, you know, we had you on last year. You were part of our getting a job in college roundtable. Thought that was amazing. Really loved it. Uh, you and Winston. And I, I thought, and Tremaine, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought it was really cool, just like your perspective and where you've been. You know, you've coached the high school level. You've coached at the JUCO level. You've coached, you were in the SEC. You were in, now you're in the Pac-12. Like, what? first of all, I guess, how did you start like i'm gonna be a coach how did you fall into that that world of being a coach yeah you know my, my dad is a um a longtime educator as is my mom my mom teaches dance so you know growing up with with my my parents right mentoring and, and developing you know the community through the youth i guess is probably the best way to say it is in my blood i was i was raised around that um you know a lot of guys that came up under my dad, you know, whether he taught them in school or we do some stuff on the side through my mom's dance company, like with West African arts and uh, drum and dance. So we'd have some of the guys like come over and drum with us. So like teenage guys and teenage girls, when I was a kid being around my house and, and my parents being their teachers, their role models, their, you know, their, their form of guidance um, is, is normal to me. Right. So I grew up in a coach household in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely a teacher centric household. Um, and then from a from a literal standpoint, you know, I started playing high school football, um, not till I was a junior, you know, my high school coach, Matt Johnson, he was a new new coach at our school, he was looking for athletes, we weren't traditionally a good football school, we yeah. were really good at basketball. Mm -hmm. And so I was playing basketball. And man, I'm six one, and I'm the shortest guy on our team, um, had a lot of the good D one players on that on that squad, went to the state championship game. So he comes to our open gym, our practice, and he sees us, you know, guys throwing the ball off the backboard and dunking and playing defense, talking trash. And I have to kind of imagine that he was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is where I need to be to recruit yeah. the hallways, right, like high school coaches do. So I was just one of the ones that he convinced to go out for the team and uh, play two years of high school ball. Then I got a, college, uh, a scholarship to a JUCO, um, Eastern Arizona, played there for two years, and – while I was there, I really got a new perspective for like the level of talent that big ball requires, that big time ball requires. You know, we had so many division one kickbacks um, from all over the, the, the country because we were a full scholarship Juco. So for whatever reason, just naturally, I became the, the communicator between the players and the coaches. You know, I was always the moderator if there was a, a bad situation happening. Uh, it's just, it was just natural to me. And I wanted to, I wanted to help my guys and I wanted to make it make sense for the coaches on their side. I wanted to bring both sides together. That's just naturally in my, in my blood. Also when my growing up, my parents, you know, being divorced and going through a separation, you always found yourself what in the middle, right. Being pulled in both directions. So yeah. that was an unfamiliar territory to me. Um, Interesting. And then I, I had an opportunity to walk on actually at U of A because I'm from Tucson um, and I, I, I never forget it felt there was, there was something holding me back. I had a, a reticence to, to following through with that offer to be a walk on at U of A and I couldn't figure out what it was. Went to church with a guy who was on the U of A football team, BJ Denard at the time. And the, the pastor that day was talking about coming into a fork in the road as you approach a mm -hmm. fork in the road and making decisions in your life. And that that kind of talk that day, that sermon that day really helped me make that decision that, man, I knew something's drawn me this way, but I, I'm supposed to be a player in mm -hmm. this game. And then just, just after that service, uh, I felt okay and accepting of the fact that I actually wanted to coach. And so the very next week, as if God, you know, <laughs> just actually went and made it happen for me, I'm training at my high school. The freshman coach doesn't show up. The varsity coach Pat Ryden says, will you help our freshmen? Will you just kind of babysit them for an hour? You know, the coach didn't show up. And I was like, yeah, yeah sure, man. You know, whatever. Yeah. 45 minutes, I don't know what I'm doing. Get them into a, a line, get them to, to say their names to each other, throwing the ball high, see who can catch it. 
run yeah. backwards and then run forward. You know, I had no idea what I was doing, but I know I loved it. And I know I loved like this look that all these, you know, 14 year olds were giving me of like, hey man, help us out, you know, like be there for us. Like and you know, how take care you? of us. Oh, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm 20 about to turn 21. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a good, that's a good not point. not that much older than the. I'm a kid. I'm a kid myself. Yeah. yeah. But you know, people have always called me an old soul. And, and again, like, even when I was, when I was eight years old, I remember a guy who was like an uncle to me. Um, I would like teach him certain things that my mom or my dad were trying to explain. So I just always found myself being able to um, just help others understand, you know, what the, what the message is, you know, what, what are they asking you to do? I've always found myself like with an interest in helping people understand that because you also realize that so much of failure is just people not understanding. Sure. That's it. If they understood the question that you were asking in the classroom, they would probably solve it very well, right? If they just understood the message, if they just understood, you know, kind of the, what's the purpose, right? And, and what are you asking me to do? What are your expectations of me? That's a big one, right? What are your expectations of me? If you can just effectively communicate, these are the expectations. This is the question. This is, this is where I see this going. I need you to execute it. Young people would be a lot more successful a lot more often. Sure. It's, you know, so, so it, and you're a big time football now, you know, you're not at the freshman high school level, your first 45 minute thing. And I think so often there's things that are just thrown at these young 18, 19 year olds in college that are like way over their heads that could be simplified to like do this or that, like one or two things, like do this or that, and you'll, you will be so much more successful. So I'd love to see things simplify. I love in, in a way where like, I know what I'm doing. I can execute on that. I, I mean, it's, it's everything. I had a, a junior college professor, a math professor tell me that for him, a genius was somebody that can take the complex and make it simple. Hmm. Right. And I was just like, man, that's, that's awesome. You know what I'm saying? I love that. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a big passion for me. And even with our young kids here at, at the university of Arizona, I like to just help translate for them you know, help translate sure. for them, whether sure. it's what their professor's asking them or what we're asking them ball wise or, you know, whatever it is, just, you, do you understand what's being asked of you? And if you ask them one-on-one -on -one where they feel like they can kind of open up, you'll be surprised how many times those guys say, no, I don't, I don't understand. And they're what? They're scared to say, Hey, I have an, I have a question. I don't understand. Can you repeat that? We're so scared to do that. Yeah. So you pull them to the side. Did they understand? Like, what was your comprehension level on that? Coach, I don't know what he was talking about. Okay, cool. But if you don't do that, how far will that kid fall behind? How quickly will, will they fall behind? Yeah. Now they're labeled as stupid, right? Or they don't get it or they can't, they yeah. can't learn, you know? Um, another one of my favorite quotes is, everybody's a genius. But if you judge a fish off its ability to climb a tree, mm -hmm. it'll live its whole life believing it was stupid. Like... You know, yeah. everybody can do it, man, in their own way. You just got to kind of, you know, pull it out of them, ask the right yeah. questions. How, how much do you think, you know, your high school and JUCO career has helped you to that mindset now? Were you, or are you always kind of that way? It helps. It helps. It helped a lot. I mean, I think I was always that way, but it helped a lot just because you get to know why guys are at the junior college level, right? Sure. Why are these talented players here when they don't want to be here? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, they didn't they didn't understand something along the way. And and don't get me wrong, some sometimes guys just, you know, made mistakes, sure. right? And sometimes those there's certain guys that they don't they don't deserve to be at that next level. They haven't earned it. You know, they've had multiple chances. Like that exists too. Yeah. But there's a big majority of guys that, you know, man, they just they just didn't quite understand something. And uh if you can effectively communicate that to them, then uh, they'll go a lot further in life. So the high school the junior college level gave me a lot of perspective and a lot of practice. Sure, sure. What, what, um, moving to this past year, season year, whatever you want to call it, what's one thing you learned this year that will help make you a better coach in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I think there was a couple, there was, I mean, there was a lot of things. There was a lot of things. It was a really good year for us, really good year for the program. It's really exciting what we're doing what our head coach is doing for us, you know, it's, it's really exciting right now. Um, I think some things I learned was, um, you know, put your personal opinions to the side 
you know, and, and just produce, you know, produce. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, it, it doesn't, unless you're a decision maker, your opinion on something doesn't always matter. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, in a good way, right? You can, sure. there's, there's, there's only so many decision makers and that's good from an organizational structure standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, there's decision makers in place and your job is to support the decision makers. Uh, I've always found myself to be supportive and respect authority and, and all those things, but I was just able to even reaffirm that belief of it. If you want to make decisions, if you wanted to have it your way, then you should be the head coach. And mm -hmm. until you're the head coach, you know, just, just give 100% support and produce in your role. Again, I did that. I feel like I did that. It wasn't that I was having a hard time with that at all. It was just when you asked what did I learn, I, for, for different reasons, that there was, there was learning that happened because of that. And then I also learned, um, again, not, not through my own personal experience, but Whatever's, whatever's happening, whatever's going on, like people know, you know, the, the good stuff, the, the challenging stuff that can get better, sure, you sure. know, people, like people know. So don't feel like you need to bring things up. You don't need to bring things to people's attention, you know, just, just kind of stay focused, continue in your role and be supportive and, um, yeah, control support. Because you can control. That's it. Because when you want to bring it up and you want to point out, you want to do this, really, sometimes you just look foolish, you know, yourself. Sure. You know, then people start questioning your focus and your motives, mm. you know, so when you can really earn that self-respect, just kind of stay and focus on what you're supposed to do and support the people above you. And then the people not beneath you, but the people beneath you, you know, bring them up along the way, you know, try to win some games. I think a lot of guys don't do that part either. The, the bo Both parts, I guess, the support, but I meant kind of to bring the guys up with them. There are guys that are great at that. And I had, I was a GA and I had, um, I don't think everyone will listen to it, but most of the people were good. There's one guy that I didn't love when I was a GA, but like my D coordinator was awesome. My, I worked with DBs, my DB coach was mm -hmm. awesome. Those guys were great to be able to work with every single day to help teach me things, to help like I made 6K a year, like even little things like on my DC would be like, hey, can you, I forgot such and such in my trunk. Can you go get it? And he'd shoot me a 20, go get yourself a sandwich. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I ate for free on campus anyway. So I didn't need that for food, but that 20 bucks, shit, that meant something good for me, right? Like little things like that, that I thought was so great. And my DB's guy was really good at like sitting down and he'd talk through like why he's doing this or like whatever was going on. And we were the same age. I think he's like, I don't know, eight months older than me. Like we were, you know, mm. like, we bet he was a new coach too, but like, here's what I'm learning. Here's what I'm teaching, why I'm doing these things. And I think that's great. I think you mentioned the, being able to support, I think that's such a valuable thing to learn too, right? You've Everyone's got their thoughts, their reasons, their opinions. Like I would do this and, uh, or I, I love that. I don't love that. And that's great to have. And it's great to learn those things. But sometimes it's just, a, it's best to keep them right here instead of. Which it, it's it's interesting because I think you, you think you understand that concept until you realize that's actually why the, the the best winners are, are are who they are everybody's on the same page everybody's pulling the same direction sure you sure. know i don't i don't always think it's because at this school when they had a losing season it's because the coaches at the winning team is a lot better than the coaches at the, on the losing team i don't i don't think that's the case sure i think it's like because there's so many good ball coaches right there's so many smart people in our profession yeah uh and and there's so many hard-working people there's so many people that love and love ball eat breathe and sleep ball so it's it's not always that right it's the, who can get everybody pulling in the same direction speaking the same language behind closed doors right even when it's not in your best interest right but it's it's yeah. if it's in the best interest of the team and and that's what the head coach and the coordinators want if you can support that 100 percent and get your players to support that 100 percent, you're going to have a chance to win sure on the flip side you can have the best scheme and the best this and the best that if everybody's not saying the same thing, preaching that same consistent message, everybody wants to be consistent, but nobody wants to, you know, preach, be consistent themselves at sure. times, sure. right? So it's just once it clicked for me of like, no, no, it really doesn't matter what you think. Like, it really doesn't matter. Matter of fact, it's detrimental what you think if what you think is not on the same page as the head coach and the coordinator, because that's how you win. It's not about what's right and wrong. Be thinking like that either, you know, from a, 
a perspective of, man, I wish we were doing this, but like, I got to do this. Like it's best to be on the same page, obviously if you can be and, and be like, here's the mission. This is the mission because it's the mission, whether you like it or not, this is best for us today and this season or whatever. Here's, here's the mission. That's right. Here's the mission. Yeah. So I, I, I think that the, the highest level of, of, of champions, you know, that's what, that's what they have. And that's why guys want to hire people that they know because they know what they're getting. They know they're getting the loyalty. Right. And then yeah. guys that are trying to get jobs, you have to try to prove that and show that, you know? Yep. And it's the, it's the relationship business, you know, from a higher perspective, you it's, it's rare. You hire somebody that doesn't, that you don't know, or that somebody, you know, doesn't know it's about exactly. trust. Can they, like you said, can they trust them? Can they be on board for this mission? Exactly. Exactly. Now I, I do think, you know, like, like Barry Odom used to always tell me, you know, to keep, you know, keep a good journal, keep a good, good diary of what's going on. So you can have your notes and he'll look back on his notes from five years ago at times. Mm -hmm. He's just a really diligent, you know, note taker. Yeah. Um, and I've kind of taken that on from him and the thoughts and ideas that I might have of how I want to do it one day, they go in that journal, mm -hmm. right? And then how you conduct yourself and how you speak in that building and to people in that building, it's, this was the mission. Like you said, this is the mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Sure, sure. Now, now take us back to 20 year old you and you just got thrown into this thing. I'm coaching guys. What do you, what do you wish that you knew back then about coaching football in general that you know now? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the reason that's hard for me is because I did so much research. I spent time with so many coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt so, I felt like I knew what I was getting into. And I felt like I paid my dues and, and, and really put a lot of time into um, learning about the profession. You sure. know, I, I, I will say that there's a, a distinct difference for me from the position coaches to the GA role right and and what yeah. skills are required right i think okay. you have some of the best gas in the world because right they can draw on visio really well the powerpoint microsoft excel they, they can break down film really well but none of those things are people asking you in an interview for a position coaching job right. you know nobody's ever i've had i think three or four interviews for division one jobs for position jobs nobody said like how good are you at excel you know what's your level of prof proficiency at microsoft word right yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Two different skill sets, but they do want to know if you can recruit, can you teach, can you lead a room? How do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I think getting in and cracking in, you know, as a support staff, the first two years at, at University of Missouri, just to be more proficient in how to use XOs and how to draw on Visio. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did, I learned those things, but it was a process to learn them. And there were some late nights and some <laughs> some tough moments when you didn't know what you were doing, you weren't really good at it. and. You yeah. just had to keep pushing, you know what I'm saying, and keep failing forward. Um, but from that standpoint, that, but I spent a lot of time with good ball coaches just picking their brains, you know, and even rest in peace, Calvin McGee, you know, he sat me down one time and was just saying, like, you better be ready to move in this profession. You better be ready to move. So whatever that means for your life and your lifestyle, like you got to be able to pick up and move. You know, what? what's your relationship situation like? Is she ready to pick up and move? Is she ready for this life? Good. You know, so those type of things I knew, but from the, from the GA standpoint, um, just being good at, you know, the computer, the first two years would have been, would have been helpful for me. Yeah. Sure. 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 <laughs> I totally get that. All right. You, you talked about how you've had a couple of interviews and to, let, let's, let's pretend I'm, I'm a guy interview. I'm a head guy interviewing you right now. What makes you unique from a DB coaching standpoint to uh, the other 10 guys that I've had convos with, or I want to bring on my staff. I think the first thing is the guys that I've been able to learn from um, just being around, just my, I think my pedigree, you know, being able to learn and um, sit back and watch, you know, some of the best that's done it, you know, Ryan Walters, head coach at Purdue and, you know, David Gibbs, you know, Dwayne Walker, you know, Charlie Harbison, uh, just being able to really be around some really great teachers, you know, and guys that have been around ball for a long time, like Chuck Cecil, you know, mm -hmm. and these type of guys. Um, I think that's one. That's that's where it starts for me is the tutelage. Uh, sure. I think the second thing is, I think I have a committed passion. You know, it's it's something that's in my blood. 
you know, to bring the best out of people, to develop them um, and to help them see things that they can't see in themselves and mm -hmm. to open new doors for them, just happen to use football to do it. You know, I, I definitely believe in being the head coach of your room. And I think, you know, in, in my room, you know, when, when that day comes, I think in my room, it's going to be about the mission of the head coach and the coordinator. And I think it's going to be an environment that fosters high level learning. I think I'm going to foster an environment that um, produces people's best, that maximizes their talents, meets them where they're at, and just brings them to a whole new world um, of achievement that they might not know or be able to see. You know, so I'm committed to that because I was raised in that. That's that's literally the timeline of my life has been, you know, development of young people. It's it's just been constantly the development of young people my whole life. So yeah. Uh, I think that's one thing. And then I think lastly, um, I really believe in, um, you know, I think I really, I think I really believe in giving guys the highest of expectations because, you know, the higher the bar that you raise, you know, the higher that they'll reach. Um, and I, and I think I'm not afraid to set those high expectations on the guys that I'm around because I believe in their success. Mm -hmm. You know, Sam Carter and I are good friends. Now the corners coach at Purdue and our, our saying to each other is your success is personal to me. Um, that's why he's having so much success. He takes the success of his guys so personal. Yeah. Um, well, through that, he demands. And if anybody knows Coach Carter, you know this. He That bar is set at the highest level for only one reason, because your success is personal to him, as 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 is mine for the guys that I that I work with and will work with in the future. Love that. Speaking of future, last, last one. I always like to end with this one. One coach you've never worked with that you'd love to work with in the future. And why, of course. Pete Carroll. Okay. Um, yeah, Pete Carroll. I've looked up to him since, um, really since his New England days. Okay. Um, and just and for me, he's kind of the godfather of DB play, you mm -hmm. know, and his technique is pure step, kick step. Um it's, it's changed the game. Um, I think that technique, that, that press technique has allowed guys to maximize their ability. I think it takes guys that aren't the fastest, aren't the twitchiest, and, and it turns them into effective press corners. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, I know it's changed the game for defensive backs. It made a lot of guys a lot of money. Um, and, and I was able to learn that through Dwayne Walker uh, here at the University of Arizona. But um, just Pete Carroll and how he, how he conducts himself, the energy. I think he's maybe he's 70 years old now and he still seems like a 30 year old coach with his energy, his competitiveness. 71. Um, yes. 71, 71. Obviously his, um, you know, we got a family member of his and our staff and our head coach worked for him. And so we have a lot of connections um, to Pete Carroll. Um, and they, you just hear all the stories that he's so talented, you know, just, got a sweet jump shot. He can draw, you know, they just say he's good at everything. You surf, know, he can right? surf, right. Just the ultimate competitor um, and, and brings it every day. And, you know, like he always says, something good's about to happen. Something good's right around the corner. So his optimism and also his competitive nature at the same time. Yeah. And to me, he's the godfather of DD play. So Pete Carroll. Well, I, I think something good is about to happen to you and I appreciate you jumping on with us. I appreciate you. Appreciate you always, brother. Thank you. Of course.